Southwest and Northeast passages, so that's a plus for shipping. <clears throat> it also increases the opportunities for mineral exploration in areas that were formerly inaccessible. So I, that's a plus to, to in many ways. But it does reduce the production of the phytoplankton. Remember the phytoplankton with the small one-celled algae, as an example? And they are eaten by the zooplankton, the animal kingdom, which eventually are eaten by krill. And we've talked about krill being a major source for a large number of the marine mammals, as well as some of our penguin friends. And it's a reduced platform, as I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, for polar bears, walrus, seals, emperor penguins, and the like. And a wind decreased platform for winter hunting by Inuit populations across the north, in Alaska, Canada, Norway, and the Russian Federation. So, since 1900, we've had dramatic changes in glaciers on the planet. Here's an example where you can see, um, is, that, is that showing up? Yeah. Uh, from 1900 to 1960, quite a dramatic change. But look what's happened between 1960 and roughly now. Almost all of those glaciers have, have gone. Let me give you a more, perhaps more dramatic example. Here's the Jakobshaven East Bay in West Greenland. Uh, it's one of the fastest uh, moving and also retreating glaciers at the moment. From the 1800s, 1851 to 2001, I believe that's 150 years by my math, it retreated about 30 kilometers or about 18 miles. But from 2001 to 2014, not even 15 years, it retreated an additional 20 kilometers, another 12 miles in less than 15 years where it took close to 150 years to travel or retreat of 30 kilometers or about 18 miles. And that has gone further uh, and has continued to retreat and that's the margin of the Greenland ice sheet we're talking about. The changes reach every corner of the globe. So can you guess how vanishing ice is linked to these impacts? The wildfires in Canada, the United States, and Europe over the past year. In Canada, I was up there last summer, Canada had 850 wildfires across the country the largest they've ever recorded. Sea level rising with catastrophic coastal flooding related to vanishing ice. Species, including us, moving to cooler climates also linked in part to uh, vanishing ice. And catastrophic mountain, mountain, catastrophic mountain flooding uh, that I just mentioned a moment ago. So let's look at an example. Wildfires in Canada, the US, and Europe have destroyed tens of thousands of acres or hectares, whichever one you're using in recent years. Some were fueled by hot, dry weather that made fire conditions extreme. What could those weather patterns be linked to? Arctic sea ice disappearing, mountain glaciers melting, or the Greenland ice sheet melting? Everybody got a, a thought on that? Related to the Arctic sea ice disappearing. So on the left here you see sea ice, first year sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, and on the right, that, I'm sorry, the first picture is from about uh, 1990. Uh, the last picture taken at the same time of the year was uh, last year. The sea ice is disappearing. It's melting. It's just disappearing in the Arctic Ocean. It's also disappearing down here in the Ant Antarctic, in the Southern Ocean. Uh, you'll remember we were all, we were all in uh, Paradise Harbor, and when we came out of Paradise Harbor, we were in the Gerlach Strait. In 1990, when I was there, 
you could not have put this ship or even a smaller ship into the Gerlach Channel because glaciers on both sides had come in to block the channel. Today, that's not the case. We all were able to traverse that channel to get into Paradise Harbor and then to go on out uh, to travel further north. That sea ice normally reflects sun's radiation coming in because of its bright surface. About 90% of the incoming solar radiation is reflected by the sea ice. With less ice, solar radiation begins to heat the ocean. If you heat the ocean, it means that the atmosphere changes because of evaporation, because of the heat loss into the atmosphere, and that changes climate patterns as well as air circulation, global circulation of the atmosphere around the planet. So, A warmer ocean heats the air above it, changing the weather patterns, and we're particularly concerned of how that affects the jet stream flowing across North America and Europe and finally Asia. Uh, as you can see here, that diagrammatically you have the subtropical jet stream coming across here and the polar one coming here, and whether that moves up or down or changes slightly in any sector like here, uh, is determined by the, the, ap the atmosphere above the ocean. So the hot, dry weather in Western Canada, the United States, and Europe results in very dry conditions. Yes, come on. <clears throat> and those arid conditions help fuel fires, that are, uh, most, uh, particularly the most damaging wildfires in recent years. Got some problems with these clicker. I guess we'll go to it manually. Uh, dry air tends to bake the ground, bake the vegetation, reduces the moisture in the soil, and that makes fire risks far more dangerous. As the Arctic sea ice keeps shrinking, the North American uh. West Coast this also pertains to Europe, becomes susceptible to much more fire weather. So what we've seen already in the wildfires across North America and Europe are likely to increase as we decrease the amount of sea ice available. What about impact two? Sea level is rising in coastal areas around the world. Some of the island nations are concerned that they'll be underwater by the end of the century. <clears throat> and melting ice in which of these locations is most responsible for future sea level rise? The Greenland ice sheet, Arctic sea ice, or the West Antarctic ice sheet? Everybody got an answer? The West Antarctic ice sheet is by far the most involved in this situation. So if we look at the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, it is huge. It contains enough water were it to melt tomorrow that sea level would immediately rise by three meters or 10 feet. Coastal areas are affected by that, both because they get flooded, but also in any storm activity, the storm wave act activity will push on to the land a major portion of the ocean. And that means flooding will be even increased. If we were to melt all the glaciers on the planet tomorrow afternoon, uh, sea level would rise by 70, a little more than 70 meters, or about 230 plus feet. And if you notice here, and keep in mind the scale we're here, anything for the first two or three kilometers, couple of miles or so inland, doesn't show up on this, but much of that area would be flooded. However, if we look at North America, you'll see much of the east coast is going to be affected. Uh, Florida, if any of you were resident there, you'd be in significant trouble. Uh, in Europe, parts of the eastern UK, Denmark and the lowlands, and on up across into uh, Finland and finally into the Russian Federation. Uh, China has some problems, particularly in the north, where there are already droughts, could be flooded with that sort of thing. 
uh, South America, the Amazon Basin, or the Plano River areas, where in Plata, Rio de Plata, where we've been, uh, even Africa and the coast here, Australia, and the north particularly is affected. And as I said, all the coastal areas don't, don't show up at this scale. So the coastal areas, one or two miles inland, four or five kilometers in some areas inland, are going to be affected. So as we heat up the melting of the West, West Antarctic ice sheet will accelerate. It may seem to be one of the biggest contributors to rise in ocean waters. And there's something that people don't often think about. Sea level isn't like filling a bathtub. In other words, the water doesn't go equally everywhere. <clears throat> it's, it's dependent on much more, it's much more complicated. It's dependent on the bottom topography, it's dependent on the currents, and how the currents push water into one area or another. Uh, as a result, sea level rises differently in different places, as opposed to rising uniformly across the planet. <clears throat> so let's take an example. We're melting the West Antarctic ice sheet disproportionately affects the area of the Gulf of Mexico, because it can dis disrupt the um, Gulf Stream in the Atlantic. And the meltwater from West Antarctica could cause that Gulf Stream, in fact it already is causing this to some extent, to slow down and spread out. <clears throat> and that pushes even more water into the Gulf. So as you can see in this diagram, we have the waters coming from the north. Remember the Arctic Ocean waters eventually come down the entire east coast of North and South America to upwell in the Antarctic, in the Southern Ocean, which gives us lots of productivity down there. But some of the water, in the, if we're talking about surface waters, are circulating as the yellow area indicates and come into the Gulf of Mexico. <clears throat> Was that slide up just a minute ago? Yeah, okay. What about impact three? The endangered right whales are swimming further north to feed. Many are dying because they're being hit by ships, they're tangled in fishing gear, or they lack food. The reason they're moving north is there's no food for them further south. So let's take a look at, at how that's happening. If we look at the glaciers that melt just on the Florida coast, uh, the, the gla glacial meltwaters could rise sufficiently to cover all of Florida by about two inches or five centimeters of water. What could that be connected to? The Antarctic ice sheet melting, west or east, glaciers disappearing from the mountains of the North, North America, or the Greenland ice sheet melting? Everyone got an answer picked out? It's basically the Greenland ice sheet melting. So let's take a look at the Greenland ice sheet. It's a massive ice sheet. It's not as large as the ice sheets in the Antarctic, but it does, it covers roughly the equivalent of the eastern half of the United States, from the Mississippi River to the Atlantic Ocean, from Maine to Florida. So it's a fairly big piece of real estate. That's a picture from the top of the Greenland ice sheet taken last year. It's a major river flowing off the ice sheet into the uh, Atlantic Ocean. That fresh water coming south along Greenland's east coast, the east coast of uh, the Maritimes, and ultimately down to the Gulf of Maine, meets the water coming the other direction, which tends to be warmer water, and meets in the Gulf of Maine, in this general area. The, the yellow here is the Gulf Stream. Warmer waters meeting colder waters from the north. So if we look at the Gulf of Maine, there's been a shift in the current that's already causing the waters of the Gulf of Maine to heat up faster than 97% of the global ocean. So we have different heat coming into the ocean in different places. What does that mean? The zooplankton, the main food source of the right whale, can't tolerate the warmer water temperatures. So they move from the Gulf of Maine past Nova Scotia and further up into northern Canada. 
a direct result of glacial melt meeting the Gulf Stream and mixing with it, and instead of staying relatively cold, getting warmer, and that is intolerable for the zooplankton of that area. That results in many right whales swimming further north into the Canadian waters, and they're, they're dying from uh, some being hit because they're now in shipping lanes that they weren't before. They get caught in fishing gear, and perhaps most importantly, there's a lack of food because the food source that they used to rely on cannot tolerate those temperatures and has moved further north as well. So the background of the start of the Arctic and Antarctic winters, a late season under ice, under sea ice, bloom of phytoplankton becomes the critical food source for the winter active zooplankton. The zooplankton are what the whales eat. Those tiny floating zooplankton hunt in dark waters that they find under the sea ice. That protects them from their predators. And they're able to find their food source. The zooplankton eat the phytoplankton. The animals eat the vegetation. <clears throat> As the polar regions thinning and vanishing sea ice occurs, more light penetrates in the ocean waters and the zooplankton have to go deeper to find their food source, phytoplankton, that's the small algae and whatnot, the vegetation, and they have to go deeper because of, of protecting themselves from their predators. In both instances, we find that there, are, as a result, there are fewer and fewer of these critters around because they are eaten by their predators as opposed to being under the sea ice protected from it. So let's look at just one of those zooplankton, the cocopods. They're the main source of many fish. For as an example, the polar cod is the main source. Its main source of food is cocopods. Who cares about polar cod? Right? Well, if you're any seal, that's what you depend on to live. So as the zooplankton are diminished, so are the polar cod, because that's their food source. And that means there are fewer cod for the seals to eat. So it affects the entire food chain here. This is an example of a cocopods. They're a crustacean about one to two millimeters in length, about 0 0.4 to 0 0.8 inches in length. And they tend to be free living cocopods floating around in the ocean, feeding on phytoplankton. What about krill? Now, Peter's talked about krill. It's the main source of many of the marine mammals, the whales, many of the seals. Quite a number of the penguin species are examples of that. And as the main source of all of those critters uh, in the Antarctic, if you don't have phytoplankton and zooplankton, you don't have krill. If you don't have krill, you've got some real problems. <laughs> You'll remember krill is about, this is about the size, to give you an idea of the perspective of krill. That's the size that krill are. <clears throat> the food source of some of our penguin friends and particularly the whales that you just saw the other day in that massive display, all of those were krill feeders. So without krill, they won't be there. They'll either have to move to another area where krill are productive, or if the krill are not productive at all, they're gone. <clears throat> so looking at the Arctic food web, you'll know, notice down here are the phyto and zooplankton, and it, here's krill, and that goes all the way up the food chain into the various whale species, seal species, some of the birds, uh, <coughs> fish obviously, walrus and the like. <coughs> Excuse me. In the Antarctic food web, the same thing is, is uh, in play. 
the phytoplankton down here are eaten by the zooplankton, ultimately by the krill. The krill affect seals, birds, baleen whales, those are the ones you just saw the other day. Some of the tooth whale species, which some of you may have seen skeletal remains of that in uh, Stanley yesterday. They had some on one of the uh, tours. <coughs> Penguin seals and like. So a huge number of animal species in the Antarctic and Arctic are relying on the phytoplankton and zooplankton, which ultimately are eaten by the next level up. Krill being a big member of that group in both the Arctic and Antarctic. What about example number four here? Glacial Valley residents worry <coughs> about the ice dammed lakes that could burst, wiping out lives and livelihoods of thousands of people. <coughs> Here's the glacier up here. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's the ice dammed moraine, the debris that was pushed up in front of the glaciers in this area cored by ice, which has not yet melted, and trapping the meltwater from the glacier in these, sorry, in these areas behind it. So many dam pro-glacial lakes pose a critical risk to anybody living downstream from them. Here's the edge of the glacier coming in here, here, the lake. The marine old systems that are ice cored and for and even if the, some of the ice melts are still a, forming a dam. <clears throat> and this is problem is connected, this is an easy one, you all got this one right for sure. The problem is connected with mountain glacier receding, melting, Arctic sea ice, Greenland or Antarctic ice sheets melting. In this case it's pretty obvious it's mountain glacial melting, right? So what you're seeing is a glacier, and the glacier is melting, and the meltwater is unable to flow directly out to the sea. It's being dammed here, which eventually bursts, and all this water goes down. And if you live down here, or your farm is down here, or your cattle are down here, they're going to be wiped out. So as the glacier shrinks, melts, proglacial lake forms, ice dam forms, and the water is only held back by the, this natural dam here. And when that bursts, it looks something like this, which happened on a uh, glacial dam bursting <coughs> in the Himalayas in 21. And all of this is going to be wiped out by the time all of these waters come charging down here. So this entire village, it will, was no longer, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the picture of the after effect of this, uh, but you get the idea of how much water comes out and flows down. So knowing how fast the ice melts <coughs> is central to adapting, for us adapting to a warmer pl planet. <coughs> And predicting that is, is not a simple task. Glaciers are dynamic, they change, and that change can happen very rapidly. Basically, the well, let's talk about the glacier for a minute. If we talk about a large ice sheet, I want you to think about having pancakes in the morning. Has everyone had pancakes in the morning? And if you pour syrup on your pancake, it doesn't stand there, it flows out in all directions. And that's what a glacier does. And part of how fast it flows depends on the bottom of the glacier and what it's flowing over. So if it's flowing uphill, it's going to be somewhat slower than if it's flowing downhill. That is the bottom of the ice, is that. If there's some melting taking place at the bottom of the ice, it's going to be more slippery and move more quickly. The bottom of the ice temperature changes with time, with pressure, and a number of other things. And if that creates where there was not before, 
water at the bottom of the glacier. It only needs to be very, very thin. Suddenly the glacier will explode forward. One of the, the glacier that I showed you from Greenland, if we look at that, flows normally at about 15 to 20 meters annually. However, when it suddenly had a burst forward, it was flowing at that on a daily basis. So there's a major change that take, can take place in the movement of the ice. If you were kept, <clears throat> if you were a glacier and the central stairwell here was a valley, and you put your campsite on the ice that's on top of the valley, the next morning it could be as much as 120 meters, about the length of a football field and a half or something, away from you. So the, the ice on both sides was moving substantially slower than the ice in the valley. And part of that, as you think about it, when you force that ice into the valley, it has to speed up because it can't all fit in the valley. So the rate of movement of the glacier varies from place to place. <clears throat> and those of us who study glaciers, we try to understand how they're related to global warming. And these questions are ultimately tied to what happens to people around the world. The shape of your coastlines, how your ocean currents are moving, how your atmospheric circulation, which controls your local weather, is determined, how temperatures are controlled above, uh, across the planet, all are related and contribute to the survival of communities, and all are tied to ice. We still have the power to slow the pace of global warming. And this is from the uh, US National Snow and Ice Data Center. Quote, we are 110% not too late if we take strong actions to reduce climate change and to rein in greenhouse gases. We can preserve the vast majority of ice. We'll see retreats, certainly. But most of that ice, we could expect to continue to be there for thousands of years. An example uh, from Chile, 1953, you see lots of ice there. 2019, almost none. So let me read you some quotes from some folks around the world. We must reverse the nefarious consequences of global warming, which is a powerful threat to our planet and to humanity. The foreign minister of Mozambique. Quote, I hope we all understand the need to move from solemn declarations to concrete actions and initiatives that are commensurate to the level of present and future challenges. Minister of Foreign Affairs of Haiti. Preservation of our environment is not a liberal or conservative challenge. It's common sense. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States. Quote, the world must come together to confront climate change. There is little scientific dispute that if we do nothing, we will face more droughts, famines, and mass displacements, basically people we're talking about, that will fuel more critical conflict for decades. President Barack Obama. By polluting the oceans, not mitigating carbon dioxide emissions, and destroying our biodiversity, we are killing our planet. Let us face it, there is no planet B. Emmanuel Macron, President of France. This world is disappearing, and its effects are being felt by all of us, or if you haven't individually experienced it, your food source may well be experiencing it. I'll close on that note, but I would ask you or remind you that to join us this afternoon at 3 o'clock for an Antarctic trivia session right here in the Starline Theater.
Okay. Thank you so much. Good morning, welcome to the Stardust Theatre. I'm Elizabeth, your cruise director, and nice to see you all here. Now we are getting you ready and excited for the trip of a lifetime down to Antarctica. Now here on board, I'm very happy to tell you that we have a very special team that have actually boarded the ship with you, who are gonna be doing lectures um, every sea day about different aspects on Antarctica. Also, on the two days that we are down in Antarctica, they're gonna be doing commentary from the bridge, telling you which side of the ship to look at, what we're seeing, and just imparting all their knowledge on you. So ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together as we start to introduce them to you. So let's welcome out Dr. Peter Carey, Dr. Norman Lasker, and Dr. Rodrigo Gomez. So these are our Antarctica experts. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go down the line and ask them to tell us a little bit about themselves, their background, and how they've come to be working on the ships with us. So if we start with Dr. Peter Carey. Good morning, everybody. I'm Peter, I'm an Antarctic nerd. I've been in love with the polar regions uh, since I was a little kid and have been working in the Southern Ocean and Antarctica since the 1980s. I'm a zoologist uh, and I've been lucky to camp out with penguins for months at a time or working with fish that live under the sea ice. But I've also been involved in educational tourism and working with uh, guiding people to the Antarctic, teaching them about the, the regions that we're visiting. I'm currently the Antarctic Program Director for Norwegian Cruise Line Holdings, and when I'm not doing educational tourism, I'm doing conservation biology work in the Falkland Islands, where with a small foundation we've bought four islands and we're fixing them up back to prime wildlife habitat. I always love coming back to this part of the world, and I'm delighted to get the chance to, to share it with you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter Carey. And now in the middle we have Dr. Rodrigo Gomez. Good morning, buenos dias, and uh, bon dia to everyone. Uh, I'm a glaciologist. I, I got a background in, in engineering. I, I did a master's oceanography, so I took a couple of those things, and I just do uh, Oh, sorry. Oh, now can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm a glaciologist from Punta Arenas, Chile, so that place we're gonna visit in a, in a few days. I have a, a background in engineering. I also did a master's in oceanography and, and a PhD in uh, Antarctic science, just for you to know. Uh, I've done a few expeditions in, um, in Patagonia using sea kayaks. So if you got any questions about South America and, and Patagonia, please, please come and, and talk to me. I, I live in Brazil for two years, so I know there's a lot of uh, uh, Portuguese speaking people aboard, so I'm happy to to practice my Portuguese as well. So please do and, and come back to, to talk to me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodrigo Gomez. And now I introduce you to Dr. Norman Lasca. Hello everyone. Is the mic loud enough for you? You can hear me all right? <laughs> yeah, I'm a retired professor of geology at the University of Wisconsin. I've worked in the polar region since the 1970s been down here a lot to the Antarctic. Most of my research, however, was in the North Polar regions, and the work that I've done down here is primarily on uh, sea ice and glaciation in this part of the world, that is to say the Antarctic. Uh, I think that's probably enough to say. <laughs> but I do have some other things to say. We're going down to the Antarctic. This is a little different than the cruise you've been on before. I mean, for right now, you know that we're going to be in uh, Punta Arenas on a certain day or Ushuaia on a certain day. Down in the Antarctic we have a tentative schedule but it's we all need to be flexible and the reason for that is that the ship cannot always get to where we hope to go because of ice conditions, because of weather conditions. So when we don't know, when we can't get to point A, we then change our mind and go to point B. So if we never know exactly where we're going to be. So I urge flexibility. 
I think you should all embrace vagueness. <clears throat> because we don't know what to do down there until we get there. And of course, most of that revolves around safety. The safety of the ship, which means your safety. And we have to worry about what the ice conditions are or what the weather conditions are in order to traverse various channels, some of which are quite narrow. So those decisions will be made when we get there. Of course we're going to try to get to Paradise Harbor and to Elephant Island, but they may be blocked by ice, which per this is obviously not an icebreaker you're on, so we can't get to those places. So please remember to be flexible. We can't get to everywhere that we hope to get to. Now the other thing you should know, there are not only the three of us, but in Ushuaia we'll have a fourth expert joining us, a historian, who'll join us, so we'll have four of us giving lectures on various topics revolving the Antarctic or preparation to getting to the Antarctic. We also have an ice pilot aboard, which is unusual for these ships. The reason, of course, is we're going to be in an area where we have ice and have to worry about avoiding that for the safety of the vessel. We're going to be giving a number of presentations, which we invite you all to attend. And then there will be questions and answers period after that. Probably not in here. We will finish the lecture and then we'll go to another place on the ship and be there for you to answer any questions you might have. We'll also have in the uh, uh, Bliss area, this room on the ship, uh, we'll have some Antarctic maps uh, up there after we leave Ushuaia and are starting across the Drake Passage. And in that area we'll also have a, uh, all of us will be there during various periods of the day for you to ask, come and ask questions at your leisure, which is a, a little different than most of the cruises you've been on, I would suspect. Um, what else? Oh, someone asked me, is it really going to be minus 30 degrees Celsius or 30 degrees Fahrenheit in the Antarctic Peninsula? No, this is high summer. Of Antarctic Peninsula is, of course, the <coughs> banana belt of the Antarctic. And in high summer, you can expect temperatures somewhere around 32 degrees, 0 degrees Celsius, going up to perhaps 45, uh, maybe as high as 50 degrees Fahrenheit, 12, 13, maybe even 17 degrees Celsius. Uh, particularly if the wind is not there and the cloud cover is not there. I've known of folks with, uh, without cloud cover, without uh, <clears throat> wind, to be in bikinis at those temperatures. <clears throat> so it can be very warm, but if, if the cloud cover is there and wind is up, it's going to be chilly. Right? But you don't have to worry about minus 30 or 40 degrees Celsius or uh, those temperatures in uh, Fahrenheit. <clears throat> I think that about covers it. Uh, I understand none of you are really excited about going to the Antarctic, is that right? How many of you will make this the seventh continent? Just out of curiosity. How many of you? Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. Well done. Uh, I know all of us are excited. We hope you're excited to see lots of glaciers. Um, maybe even a penguin or a whale. Possibly. In that regard, it would be very helpful for you to have because we will not be making landings. So it's not that you won't see penguins, but they will be in the water or on land, which will be somewhat distant from the ship. So that's something to just keep in mind. And uh, on that note, I think I'll turn it over to uh, Peter. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Please give them a, a big Norwegian star welcome on board. We're just going to reset the stage, and then we shall start with our 10 a.m. lecture. So thank you very much. Stay tuned, and thank you, gentlemen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we do continue. Now we are starting the first of our Antarctica lectures and we are going to introduce you one more time to Dr. Peter Carey about our penguin appreciation. So please give him a big warm welcome, Dr. Peter Carey. Hello again. Hello again. And uh, just a quick show of hands before we start this. How many people here hate penguins? Oh, there's, there's a couple you might have gotten fleeced in a card game by a rock hopper or something in the past, but but 
mostly people like penguins, and they're they're seen as cute. They they look like bipedal people. You know, they walk upright, and so we tend to love them. But they're even more amazing than they are adorable. And what I would like to share with you in this presentation is some of those great adaptations and lifestyles they have to live in such a challenging place. And I want to start by mentioning the kinds of penguins we won't be talking about. So, maitre d' penguins, no, no mention. We won't talk about these kind of penguins either. And that's a whole nother topic. But we will constrict our talk to the flightless birds that so many of us have just admitted we don't hate. And you'll see this one standing on an iceberg, which is what we all assume uh, uh, penguins do. And yes, there are penguins in the Antarctic, but they're not exclusively in the Antarctic. There are penguins found in deserts. And many of you will be going to see some of them tomorrow when we get to Puerto Madryn. There are penguins in temperate places where there's actually some lush greenery, including in New Zealand, where we have a jungle penguin that lives in a temperate rainforest nesting among the ferns and the trees. So while they're not exclusively Antarctic, they are exclusively Southern Hemisphere. There are no penguins in the Arctic. And yet, they share a name with a bird from that region. This is the great auk, and I don't think there's anybody on board here who has seen one of these. Uh, they went extinct in 1844. But look at this bird. Doesn't it look like a penguin? And that's exactly what the mariners from Europe, making the first voyages into the southern hemisphere, thought when they spied these black and white birds that couldn't fly and walked very awkwardly, and they called them penguins because that's what they called the great auk from the early Breton and Welsh language of a white head. Now, this bird and penguins are not in any way related, but the similarity was such that they took on the name of the great auk. This is the last thing a krill ever sees. You're seeing the cross section here of an Adeli penguin, and I want to draw your attention to the round shape. Penguins are swimming birds. They're the ultimate diving bird. They're making their living underwater, and you don't want to have a lot of long, gangly limbs getting in the way while you're trying to move through water. And penguins have a great torpedo shape. It's also excellent for holding in your actual body heat, having that high body volume to surface area ratio. Penguins float quite low in the water. If you're used to seeing a duck or a goose sitting on a lake, they float, they float very high. But as a diving bird, that would be quite counterproductive for penguins. They're quite dense and quite heavy. So they're, they're buoyant, but, but not fluffy. And to move through the water, they use their wings. But their wing is so highly specialized for swimming that, in fact, we call them flippers now. But if you look at the, the well, bottom image, the bottom now, image there, that is the no, bone structure inside no, no, no. a penguin wing. No, no, no. And it's no, no, no. very no, no, no. similar to what you find if you carefully no, no. ate a chicken wing, for example, no, no, no. except in penguins the bones are flattened no, no. and make no, no. a better pattern. No, no, no. Penguins are evolved from flying birds, and there used to be even bigger oh. penguins than we have today. That's an emperor penguin on the left there, which is the largest species still found, and it's about three feet tall. Um, but there next to it is one of the fossil penguins found in New Zealand. And for, for scale, here's a, here's a model from the museum in New Zealand of that bird. Imagine a whole colony of penguins this size. That would be a very intimidating place to visit. So these birds that we see today are highly specialized swimmers, but their ancestors were able to fly through the air. We're looking at an x-ray of a chin strap penguin here, and I want to draw your attention to a couple of features. Uh, at the top center, you can see where the, the head is and the eye with the beak kind of overlaying on top of one of the flippers. But look on the right-hand margin. You can see the flipper bones that go down towards the bottom corner. And look at, the, look at the legs. One of the things we all love about penguins is that they seem to waddle. They don't, they've got these short little legs and they take cute little steps and that's endearing. But when you see them on an x-ray, there's quite a lot of leg there. 
And what's really going on is they, they have long legs, but most of the leg is encased inside the body. And this helps with streamlining for that the hydrodynamic nature and also keeps the body temperature contained. And if we look at a penguin in mid-waddle, you can see there's the knee just in here, inside. Now, of course, walking is not what penguins do best, it's swimming. Uh, this penguin is swimming from left to right, and it's doing so by flapping its wings, just like a sparrow does to fly through your garden. It, the penguin is flapping its wings to fly through the water. All the power comes from the wings. The webbed feet they have are just tucked in under the tail and used for steering. All the birds found in the world today are without teeth. But if you're eating seafood all the time, like squid and fish and krill, which is a little crustacean like a shrimp, if you're eating that kind of slimy stuff, it does help to have something to grip with. And penguins have a lot of these little bumps on their tongue and the roof of their mouth. They're called papillae, but they're basically uh, little projections that give them some traction on slippery food. The feathers on penguins are denser than almost any other bird in the world. If you've ever handled a bird, say you had a, you know, a blackbird fly into the window of your house, or you've grown up on a farm and plucked a chicken or something like that, you will know that feathers are grow in tracks. There's a line of feathers, and then there's a gap where there's no feathers growing out of the skin. That's not the case with penguins. Penguins have feathers growing on almost all of their body with the same sort of density that mammals have fur growth. With two exceptions, and one is very conspicuous here, and that's that little slit you see on the belly. That's called the brood patch. And both males and females have this, and it's a spot that is unfeathered, and by contracting muscles under the skin, the bird can open that up, and it allows the, the egg or the small chick to nestle in against the bare skin of the adult. And that's great if you're trying to share your body heat with the youngins. If you had feathers on all of that, that's trapping your body heat inside, not sharing it. So both male and females will have a brood patch. Look at the density of the feathers here. That's the skin along the bottom of the photo. But they're tightly packed in, and a healthy penguin has feathers in such tight shape and well maintained that the skin never actually gets wet. These feathers prevent water touching the skin, which of course, if it did touch the skin, a lot of heat would be lost. And here's a, a close-up of the back of a flipper. They look like, these feathers just look like shingles on a roof. Penguins eat seafood and they eat it underwater, so they take in a bit of salt water while they're dining. And to get rid of the extra salt water, they have a special gland called a salt gland, and it's located just above the eye. This is a, a skull of a penguin, and in the little trenches there that you can see, those are where the salt gland would sit. And this helps them get rid of the extra salt that they take in. A reminder, penguins are birds. I often hear people talk about penguins and birds as if they're not all in the same, but they've got feathers. Uh, they even tuck their head under the wing to sleep sometimes, even if it looks silly because the wing is a flipper. And penguin feet are fascinating because they're another spot that is not feathered. And so this is an area without insulation that can be used by the penguin to control its body temperature. Most of the time, that's to retain body heat. And so they'll minimize the blood flow into their feet so they don't lose too much heat to the atmosphere. Uh, but sometimes, uh, on standing on ice, of course, that's when you really want that. Um, penguins, like the emperor penguin, will even sometimes lean back and just sit on their heels to, to get their feet off of contact with the ice. But the penguins can also use their feet as radiators. They can flush a lot of blood through this uninsulated part of the body and lose heat quickly to the environment. And they want to do that on hot days or if they've been exerting themselves quite a lot. So it's a very, very valuable thing for the penguins to be able to control their body temperature. Now one of the great things about penguins 
for tourists as well as scientists is that when you see one penguin, you see a lot of penguins usually. <laughs> they are colonial. They like to hang out together. And so it's great from a scientific perspective. You get this great sample size in one spot. You can observe hundreds of nests. And of course, for folks like us who are going to just look at these marvelous birds, we'll get a chance to see more than just one or two. Put on my view. Okay. Now I'll just run through some of the world's penguins. Uh, the number of penguins in the world is under a bit of dispute now. It's generally considered to be 18 species worldwide. But recent analysis from a molecular biologist so suggests that we might be 22 species. And that is uh, not mainstream accepted, but it seems to be headed that way. The emperor penguin here, the largest penguin, found only in Antarctica and only in the far south. So I don't expect we'll, we'll get far enough south to see emperors. They're nesting in the winter time, in the middle of the Antarctic winter. It's an incredible physiological feat that they can do this. And uh, somehow they've managed to hire a publicist, too, because this species has got all kinds of movies about it. Happy Feet, mm, March of the Penguins. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of publicity, it, but it's not surprising it when you stop to listen to what they're saying about how amazing it is that birds are, are reproducing, breeding, raising their chicks in the dead of an Antarctic winter. The other penguins that live in the Antarctic do not stay there for the winter, but the emperor actually breeds them. In the sub-Antarctic, there's the king penguin, and we'll encounter these. Some of you may be on the tourist in Falklands Malvinas, and you might see king penguins which are nesting there. There are some in uh, far south of South America, um, but they're mostly found on sub-Antarctic islands, so not quite Antarctica, not quite the mainland. And then there's a group of crested penguins, and these are scattered in a variety of different places, mostly outside of Antarctica. This is the Fjordland crested, that jungle penguin I mentioned before. It's found only in the southwest corner of New Zealand. And the erect crested penguin found only on a couple of islands south of New Zealand. The macaroni penguin, which does find its way into a little bit of the Antarctic. And this bird has no connection to macaroni the pasta. Its name comes from the ornate plumes on the head here. There was a slang term for Englishmen who spent...